Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And now I'm going to demo out the Al Ecology Lab or the Ecology Lab. Okay, so this lab is, the purpose of this lab is really for you, kind of, it's kind of twofold. For you to understand a little bit of feeding ecology of certain organisms, in this case, barn owls, okay? And also for you to be able to work through a, di a dichotomous key. So if you remember some of the early, well, one of the very early labs, we looked at biodiversity, you created a dichotomous key of either um, dolls or uh, people in your class, okay? This lab, you're going to work with a already designed dichotomous key, which is really advanced, okay? And some of you will struggle with the terminology, et cetera, of this dichotomous key, but it's very important for researchers to create these dichotomous keys so we can uh, key out species based on some physical features that work every time, okay? And we talked about this before, you know, you can't just use features that might change, like hair color or, um, you know, size of like the tail or how much hair they have, so the length of the hair. Those features are not, are not very good features to use. Some features that are excellent to use are teeth or skull um, openings, which we call orbitals. These kind of things are excellent to use when trying to classify different organisms. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an owl pellet, okay, and we're going to drop it into water and let it soak there for a while so it can loosen the hair up. And then I'm going to pick all the bones out of that owl pellet and get the skulls. And that's probably the most important piece. Now I want you to know the bones and I want you to know like, what, what a femur is, what a scapula is, these kind of things, what rib bones are, etc. But you're not going to classify organisms based on their scapula or leg bones or whatever. But the skulls, especially the, the upper jaw um, of the organism, is needed to classify them. Okay? So what I'm going to do is demo that out. I'm going to let this soak. I'm going to pick it out, pick through it pull out all the skulls, and then I'm gonna show you how to run through a dichotomous key, examining different pieces of the skull and getting a identification for a given mammal, okay? And so these owls are eating small rodents typically, sometimes they're eating shrews, sometimes they're eating voles, mice, these kind of things, and we're gonna see what this owl ate, okay, when we come back. Hi all, I'm back and now we're going to start analyzing. I'm going to start walking you through the owl ecology lab or the use of an owl pellet to determine what uh, small mammals, birds, etc. were barn owls eating in a given region. Okay, so if you remember, I told you I was going to place that owl pellet in water and I did so. so it kind of makes a giant mess. It's a lot of hair. There's some bones in there. And I picked out some bones and some skulls to examine. Okay? And I'm gonna walk you through the process of identifying these two species. And I'm gonna walk you through the process of identifying bones also, because there are some bones that are important for you to know for this lab. So I'm going to project it through the microscope onto the computer. Now realize that you don't have to have a microscope to examine these pieces. Um, it's just for me, it's a lot easier for me to point at a small dot or a certain tooth or something like that um, when it's magnified, okay? So we're gonna go through that. First, I'm gonna go through some bones that I want you to know. So I'm gonna pull up a document that has the bones and this document is given to you. It's on Canvas. Um, and it has the bones and then I'm gonna show you the bones, okay? And then, uh, 
and then we'll go through and I'll identify some skulls and I'll show you some features uh, that are very important for the identification of skulls. Okay, so first, let's go ahead and I'm going to pull up the document that has the bones on it. Okay, so you can see here. Uh, the first bone that I would like you to know is a shoulder blade or the scapula. So I'm going to pull that bone um, and I'm going to throw it under the microscope and show you some, you know, so how you can identify the scapula. Most of you will already be fairly familiar with a scapula or a shoulder blade. You've probably seen them before. Um, and so here you can see there's some hair on it still, but you can see the features of the scapula. You can see where it connects to the upper arm bone, okay, over here. You can see the ridge that runs, okay, hold on a second, that runs the length of the scapula there is a ridge. Let me get a pointer. Okay, so there's a ridge right here. And that's what most people break when they break their scapula. They, they break this ridge here. And then you can see that it's kind of a flat part. Now, um, clearly there, you know, the bird had, this is the underside, the bird had consumed all the flesh off of this. But, you know, in a scapula, if you've never dissected an organism, there would be a bunch of muscles attached to both sides of the scapular ridge, and that helps, you know, uh, with the movement of the op upper arm and the chest muscles. Okay. All right. So that's the, that's the first one. Okay, we're going to jump back real quick. See what the second one is? That's a hip bone. Okay, so I'm gonna grab a hip bone and show you the hip bone, okay? One of the great features of a hip bone, easy to determine hip bone, is it's a closed circle, okay? especially in rodents. You have this closed circle, and then you have this um, indentation, which is you know one part of a socket and I'll show you the upper leg bone fits right in to this um, socket and allows for the movement, the rotation of the leg, okay? Um, and then you can see the other end of this bone, okay? Easy, fairly easy to tell no matter the size, okay? Um, but that's, that's the hip bone, one side of the hip bone. Okay. The other side looks just like it. Okay, upper leg bone. All right, so I'm going to pull an upper leg bone, and you should notice right away on the upper leg bone, there is that ball. So it's a ball and socket. That's going to fit into the hip, okay, and rotate freely in that hip. And then you can see the other end. Um, has a groove, okay, which we call where the kneecap or the patella would sit um, is in that over that groove, okay. And so I'll show you the purpose of that groove. But the upper leg bone, pretty easy. It's got that ball on it, um, and okay. lower leg bone is next. So let me pull a lower leg bone. Okay, um, you can see the lower leg bone is actually two bones that are attached to each other. The thick bone in front, okay, is called the tibia and the thin bone in the back is called the fibula. Okay, but that right there, that piece on the front, that's where the patella would cover that and that would sit on um, 
the upper leg bone. So this is the lower leg bone. Attached to the bottom of this is going to be a foot. Okay, now you're not likely to find a, a complete foot because the foot consists of many, many small bones that are attached with cartilage and ligaments and things like that. And so when the owl consumes it, often that all gets broken up and you might see little teeny digits, okay, but um, maybe not in the entire foot. Sometimes you get an entire foot and you can definitely tell it's a foot. All right, Let's see what else we got. All right, some rib bones, backbones, and then the foot. Okay, so um, I'll show you these kind of in that order. The rib bone, it's really simple. Um, most of you have consumed ribs or um, at least seen ribs before. That's the rib bone, um, pretty simple you'll see lots of these rib bones. Okay. Backbone or part of the vertebral column. You can see here, and this is part of the vertebral column. Though, you know, sometimes you'll, ha you'll have in your sample, you might have a tail with a bunch of, a bunch of vertebral segments to it. Um, other times you might just have simple uh, backbone segments. And I don't, I didn't have a foot. So I can't really show you that. I can show you um, small bones to the foot, but you're not going to really be able to tell uh, anything, you know, in particular. Uh, so you can see these little teeny bones that are part of the foot um, regardless, okay? All right, so that brings us to start starting to examine a skull, okay? So here, is a rodent skull that I pulled out um, of the sample and so I'm going to try to make it so you can see some different features of this skull. Um, I have it all the way out zoomed out so that's that's why you'll see that a microscope is not really necessary to examine these features and identify the species. Um, I actually prefer not to use it, but when I'm showing you things like, you know, pointing out pieces of the skull, uh, it, sometimes it's nice. Okay, so if we're looking at the skull, you can see this this ridge right here. Okay, that's called the zygomatic arch. You can see an opening right here, right on the front piece of the zygomatic arch. That's called the infraorbital opening. Okay, these are the incisors um, right there. Those teeth are called incisors. Okay. And then they have cheek teeth okay, or chewing teeth, and those occur here. Okay. So we're going to look at some of these different features, and I'm going to show you um, how to identify different features. Okay. And we're going to run through a dichotomous key examining these different features until we can get a positive identification on the organism. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to a different document. You also have this document. And because it has this organism has incisors, I know this organism is a rodent. And because it only has one pair of incisors, I know this organism is a rodent. So if I go back to the scope, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So you can see here, this organism only has one pair of incisors. So that's what um, will tell me that it belongs to the group Rodentia. If it had two pairs of incisors, so one here and then one here, okay, then it would show me that that's a legomorph or that is a rabbit or hare and it belongs to that group. But in this case, I know one pair of incisors is rodent. Okay, so I can jump to the dichotomous key and I can start examining rodents or rodentia and I'm looking at the skulls. So just like the dichotomous key that you created early on, we're going to start with number one. So 
we're going to examine the skull and we're going to see the skull has a large conspicuous infraorbital opening okay? the nice thing about good keys is they will show you a picture of what they're talking about so if we come down it would have this large opening here if it has this large opening we're going to go to number two if it has a small opening next to the zyg zygomatic arch okay we're going to go to 25. so flipping over to the scope again let's see what this organism has okay so looking right here you can see that there is a very large infraorbital opening with a bunch of hair in it so let me flip it over and see if this one I did a better job at cleaning yeah a little bit um, let me zoom this out so you can see there you can see that infraorbital opening it's large um, and I'll show you just for comparing purposes of skulls okay this is an infraorbital opening on a different skull that's small okay so you can see the difference this is small it's not up against the, net, the zygomatic arch it's just a small one that's right here on the rostrum of the organism okay so back to this guy so it does have a large one so we're going to go to two the infraorbital opening is on the side of the rostrum okay if it's on the side of the rostrum right here it's a great basin pocket mouse now the interesting thing is i happen to have a great basin pocket mouse skull and i can show you what that large infraorbital opening looks like on an organism okay so you can see this hole here this infraorbital opening is not up against the zygomatic arch okay it's on the side of the rostrum and it's large this skull even though i don't have any teeth on this skull or anything like that all i needed was two features it has a large infraorbital opening and it's on the side of the rostrum to identify the skull so even though half the skulls is cracked off and you can't see um, much of the thing and and the back of the skull is gone okay there's no teeth in this organism i can still identify that really quick by saying oh look it's got a large infraorbital opening on the side of the rostrum okay um, i know the positive identification of this organism boom this is a great basin pocket mouse perignathus parvus okay see so once you get used to it it flows pretty easy i know that the skull that we're trying to identify right here does not have a large infraorbital opening on the side of its rostrum okay it has a large infraorbital opening okay up against the zygomatic arch okay so that means that i have to continue to identify this or move through the dichotomous key so i can move to three it's not okay so infraorbital opening exceeds the foramen magnum in size and round in i in outline this is a porcupine okay well just from common knowledge okay i'm going to pause the video and i'm going to come back okay so we left off we we're talking about the Furman magnum okay and whether or not the infraorbital opening is larger than the Furman magnum okay and this is a porcupine now it should be obvious to you okay if you're just using a little bit of common sense that a skull this size is not going to belong to a porcupine even though you may have never seen the skull of a porcupine you would most people would know well a porcupine is probably a little too large for a barn owl to swallow whole and cough it back up and indeed this is the skull of a porcupine and you can see that infraorbital opening 
right there next to the zygomatic arch, see how big that is. Now the form of magnum is this opening here in between the incisors and the cheek teeth. That opening is the form of magnum. So this hole is bigger than that hole and therefore this is a porcupine. Okay? So it's, you know, sometimes it's just a little bit of common sense to know that we're not dealing with a porcupine or a beaver or something along those lines. Instead, we're dealing with a pocket mouse or we're dealing with, you know, a vole or something like that. Okay, so back to the dichotomous key. Okay, you can see here, we know that it is not a porcupine, so we got to go to B. Now what we're interested in is the um, is that infraorbital open op opening is it oval or v-shaped in outline okay so let's jump back over to the scope and make that determination so here's the skull I'm gonna flip to the side that's not kinda not so dirty or doesn't have so much hair I guess you could say and once it once the microscope focuses, we should be able to say, okay? So examining this infraorbital opening, trying to get it so you can see it, okay? I determ determined that this is not an oval, but rather this is V-shaped. It comes to a point here at the bottom. So there is a distinct V-shape and is not a complete oval. Now, sometimes this is difficult to determine if you've never looked at very many skulls. Um, that's okay, because if you determine wrong, and you said, hey, this is an oval, the next step might be a feature that you're like, it doesn't have either of these features. Then you know that you made a mistake above on the dichotomous key, and you need to go back. Okay, so I determined that this is V-shaped, so let's look at the key. And so I know that this is oval or V-shaped, so we've got to go to four. Now, infraorbital opening is oval. Now I go to five. I determined that it's V-shaped, so I'm going to go to seven. Okay, so I'm just going to go down to number seven. All right, now I'm interested. Is the crowns of the molars with triangles or prisms of dentine surrounded by enamel, okay? If I don't know what they're talking about, I can look at 96, 97. So I can look at these pictures and you can see that there's a dentine, which is going to be kind of a darker color on the inside and enamel, which is going to be that, I, I, which is going, sorry, you're going to have this dentine on the outside, okay, which will be a different color than the enamel on the inside. Okay? And so we're going to examine this. Um, the other thing is this piece here where it says crowns of, of the molars with cusps and lacking the triangles or prisms. So we're going to look for triangles. We're going to look for differences in color. Okay? And if there's no differences in color and it's a single colored tooth and there's no cusp, um, or I'm sorry, and the crowns have cusp like this picture here. So it's going to be more of a rounded tooth and there's going to be these cusps that um, protrude from the tooth. That's how we're going to dif differentiate between going to number eight or going to number 21. Okay. So. If we flip this guy over, I'll pull the scope back up and easily, even without a scope, you can tell here that there is definitely a difference between the outside of the tooth and the inside of the tooth. So this organism clearly has dentine and enamel um, on, on their teeth, on their molars. So we know that we need to go to eight 
to identify this organism. Okay, so we're going to go down to eight. Now we're interested in the zygomatic plate extends anteriorly from the zygomatic process of the maxillary, okay? Like figure nine, okay? So does the zygomatic plate extend, okay? Or is the zygomatic plate not extending, okay? Now, if that feature is not clear because maybe you have a broken zygomatic plate or something like that, um, we can examine something else. So molars with prisms not arranged in alternating triangles. Molars with prisms arranged in alternating triangles. Well, we already know that the molars have prisms arranged in alternating triangles because we just examined that. And sure enough, when we bring this up, these are alternating triangles. So fairly easy to know that it is not a bushy-tailed wood rat. We gotta go to nine, okay? The length of the maxillary tooth row is greater than 14 millimeters. The length of the maxillary tooth row is less than 14 millimeters. Okay, well, an easy way to do this is just measurement. If you don't know what 14 millimeters looks like, you can just take a measurement. So I have a ruler here, and I can just put this ruler up to this teeth row, and I can tell you that it is far less than 14 millimeters. It is about seven millimeters, about half of that, okay? So I know, again, that um, this is not a muskrat skull, okay? And so I need to go to 10. I go to 10, and it says the reentry angles are deeper on the outside of the upper molars, okay? The first and second molar reentry angles extend to the inner border of the tooth. Okay? If you don't know what that is saying, it says to look at figure 96. 96 is up here. And so we're looking at the anterior side. This is towards the head. Do the angles, are, are they deeper on the outside than on the inside? So we can pull that up on the skull, and we can look, and we can say, all right, are these angles here, this is the anterior side of the head, are they deeper on the outside than on the inside? Hmm, they look to be pretty close to the exact same to me. Okay? So I would say, no, they're not deeper. So that means I'm gonna go to 12. So this is not a limbing. I'm going to jump down to 12, and I'm going to examine what 12 says. On the mandibular molar, the inner reentry angle is deeper than the outer reentry angle. Okay, so the mandibular molars. Okay, um, what's going on? Are they are they deeper or not as deep? Okay. On the mandibular molars, the inner reentry angle is about the equal depth. Okay, so we're going to see are they deeper on the um, inner side or, um, or are they about the same between the inner and the outer side? Okay, so let's jump back over. We'll look at these inside molars. Okay, are these about the same, the reentry angles? and depth, I would say yes. Okay. They're about the same. There's not a great deal of difference. Like the picture, you don't see these giant openings um, or, or differences between the two. Okay. So it's not a heather vole. We're gonna go to 13. The bony, bony palate terminates as a thin transverse shelf extending between the last molar. Okay. So let's go down and make sure that we see what they're talking about. So is there this shelf right here, um, or does it extend even past that? Okay, so it terminates as a sloping median ridge between the last molar bordered by the lateral pits. So do you have these lateral pits that come up? If it does, then it's 15. If there's no lateral pits, then it's 14. Let's jump over and check it out. Um, it's kind of difficult 
to see on this one because it's not super clean but I think you can see that there's a pit that runs here and there's a pit that runs here on the other side and that the the shelf is not even so it's not a clean cut shelf that goes between the two okay it's more of this than this okay so in that case we're going to jump to 15 second upper molar with three closed triangles and a rounded posterior loop okay so the second upper molar okay, is going to have this rounded loop and three triangles it, if it has that, it's going to be a metal bowl. If it doesn't have that, so it's a, if it's lacking that loop, then we've got to go to 16. So let's jump over. Okay. Let's look at that second one. Is there one, two, three, and a posterior loop? One, two, three, and a posterior loop. Okay. Based on this key, this organism is a metal bowl. Okay, my crotus pennsylvanicus. Okay? And that's how you go through a dichotomous key. Now, let's say, you know, you get to a point and you're like, all right, um, this is saying it's a beaver. Okay? Or this is saying that it's a mountain beaver. Again, the use of common sense. This is a beaver skull. Okay? You have to you know, sometimes you might have to say, all right, well, maybe I need to Google what a mountain beaver looks like before I say, hey, I, I identified that skull as a mountain beaver, like an apelodontia um, skull, okay? There's no owl that's going to eat a beaver and be able to vomit, that's what a pellet is, it's vomit, a skull back out, okay? So again, even though this might be a difficult task, and some of you will, it will be a challenge to you. That's fine. You can always email me, text me, um, pictures of your skull, and I can help you get to the identification. The purpose of this is not for you to be a mammologist and be able to identify skulls. The purpose of this is for you to work through a dichotomous key by examining pictures and identify your skulls. Okay? So with that, if, if you have questions, again, clearly contact me otherwise enjoy it's kind of a fun procedure you're gonna find lots of different skulls um, you might find some bird skulls remember birds do not have teeth okay so if you have the skull and it looks like it's got a long bill um, and there's no teeth then most likely you have a, a bird there are other skulls that you might find you might find things like shrews Shrews do not have incisors, so they don't have those big orange or yellowish teeth. They have very sharp teeth, um, like a bunch of canines. And you're going to see that um, if you pull a shrew, they'll have very fine little teeny canines, and that'll allow you to know, hey, I got a shrew versus a mouse or a rat or a vole um, or, you know, other things that occur. Okay? All right. Uh, when we come back, we'll do another lab.